Today, we will discuss the defenses to obligations on negotiable instruments. Our jumping board to a discussion on defenses is Section 55, which says, When title defective, the title of a person who negotiates an instrument is defective within the meaning of this act. When he obtained the instrument or any signature thereto by fraud, duress, or force and fear, or other unlawful means, or for an illegal consideration, or when he negotiates it in breach of faith, or under such circumstances, as amount to a fraud. Actually, kaunti lang ang naka-enumerate sa Section 55 at hindi siya naka-identify whether they are real or absolute defenses or personal or equitable defenses. But later on, we will identify each one of them. And furthermore, this is not a close enumeration kasi take note that there is here a statement which says, uh, or other unlawful means at saka dito under such uh, circumstances as amount to a fraud. So, may mga iba pang defenses na hindi nakalagay dito na pag-uusapan natin later on. So, there are two kinds of defense, the real or absolute and the personal or equitable. A real or absolute defense is one that attaches to the instrument and is good against all holders, including a holder in due course. Kahit na holder in due course, hindi makakasingil. But a personal or equitable defense is one that is good only against a holder not in due course. Ibig sabihin, yung holder in due course makakasingil pag personal defense lang. The first Real defense is forgery under section 23, which says, Forged signature effect of. When a signature is forged or made without the authority of the person whose signature it purports to be, it is wholly inoperative and no right to retain the instrument or to give a discharge therefore or to enforce payment thereof against any party thereto can be acquired through or under such signature unless the party against whom it is sought to enforce such right is precluded from setting up the forgery or want of authority. Forgery is the signing of another person's name with the intention to defraud and frequently consists of the making of a signature designed to appear as if made by the person whose name is written. The writing of one's name by another who is not authorized to do so imposes no obligation upon the one whose name is signed. Even a holder in due course cannot recover from the principal. If the name of the maker, drawer, or acceptor is forged, the instrument is not binding on them. Even a holder in due course is not permitted to enforce such a pretended obligation. So that's why this is called a real defense because even a holder in due course cannot collect payment from him whose signature was forged or was written by a person without authority from him. However, there are persons who are precluded from setting up forgery or want of authority, and they are the following. Number one, those who warrant the genuineness of the instrument, and these are the endorsers and the persons negotiating by delivery under sections 65 and 66. Number two, those who warrant the genuineness of the signature of the drawer, and this is the acceptor under section 62. Number three, those who ratified expressly or impliedly the forgery. And number four, those whose negligence contributed to the perpetration of the forgery. Now, these uh, people are precluded from setting up the defense of forgery and therefore they are liable on the instrument. The second defense is material alteration under section 124 which says, alteration of instrument effect of. Where a negotiable instrument is materially altered without the assent of all parties liable thereon, it is avoided except as against a party who has himself made, authorized, or assented to the alteration and subsequent endorsers. But when an instrument has been materially altered and is in the hands of a holder in due course, not a party to the alteration, he may enforce payment thereof according to its original tenor. So, under section 125, 
these are the matters that constitute a material alteration if they are altered. So, ano yung pagkakaiba ng material alteration sa 1 to 5 at sa forgery sa 23? Yung forgery pertains only to the signature of the maker, of the drawer, the acceptor, and the endorsers. Pagka uh, pineke yung firma nila or inilagay yung firma nila, isinulat yung firma nila na wala naman silang pahintulot, then forgery yun. Signature lang ang involved doon. Dito sa 124 at 125, maraming involved. Tulad dito sa date, the sum payable, the time or place of payment, the number of the relations of the parties, the medium or currency in which payment is to be made, or which adds a place of payment where there is no place of payment indicated in the instrument. So, dito may nakalagay na, pero pinalitan ni holder, or pinalitan ni naman. Pwedeng yung nagpalit yung party to the instrument, or a stranger to the instrument. May nakalagay na pinalitan nila. Isa lang dito yung hindi pinalitan, yung F where there is no place of payment, pero nilagyan niya. Halimbawa, I promise to pay to the order of A, 10,000 on December 30, 2020, period. Wala nakalagay kung saan. And then si holder, halimbawa si pay o kaya si holder after a negotiation, nilagyan niya ng at ABC Bank Makati. Wala namang ganun sa original form. Therefore, that is a material alteration. And we will uh, discuss further the effects uh, presently. So let me go back to section 125 for examples of material alteration. As to date, for example, the date of the instrument is December 30, 2020, but the holder changes it to maybe November or September, October to accelerate maturity. He makes it October 30, 2020. That is material alteration as to the date. As to the sum payable, for example, I promise to pay the, to the order of A, 10,000 pesos, but the holder makes it 100,000. He alters the amount. Then that is material alteration as to the sum payable. As to the time or place of payment, I promise to pay to the order of A, 10,000 at 8 o'clock p.m. of December 30. 2020, but he makes it 8 o'clock a.m. of December 30, 2020. Then that is material alteration. Or place of payment. I promise to pay to the order of A, 10,000 uh, at ABC Bank, Makati, but he makes it ABC Bank, Baguio City. Then that is a material alteration as to the place of payment. Number of relations, I promise to pay to the order of A, 10,000, but he makes it to the order of A and B, 10,000, so ginawa niyang dalawa yung pay it. Then that is material alteration as to the number or the relations of the parties. The medium or currency in which payment is to be made, I promise to pay to the order of A, 10,000 pesos, he alters the amount or the currency to $10,000, then that is material alteration as to the medium or currency. Itong letter F na pag-usapan na natin ito, there is no place of payment, I promise to pay to the order of A, 10000 period, pero nilagyan niya ng at ABC Bank Baguio or ABC Bank Makati, then that is material alteration because he, had, he adds a place of payment where there is no place of payment indicated. So, those are examples of material alteration under section 125. So, the rule in material alteration is this. Material alteration discharges all parties except subsequent endorsers and those who have made or assented to the alteration. The maker of an altered note or drawer of an altered bill has a real or absolute defense against the instrument in its altered form but has only a personal defense against it in its original form. The rule is that a holder in due course may enforce payment of the instrument according to its original tenor. Alteration is a real defense only to the extent that the holder in due course cannot enforce the instrument as altered. He can enforce it only according to its original tenor. 
if the bill was drawn for 1,000 and raised without authority to 10,000, a holder in due course can recover only 1,000. However, from his immediate endorser or from any endorser subsequent to the alteration, he can recover 10,000 even if such endorser has no notice of the alteration. This is in view of the endorser's warranty that the instrument is genuine in all respects what it purports to be under section 50, 66. If, however, the change from 1,000 to 10,000 is apparent on the face of the instrument, the holder is not a holder in due course and can recover nothing. Where the date has been cleverly altered so that the alteration is not apparent and thus makes the instrument appear to be due soon as it would be as drawn, a holder in due course cannot enforce payment until the true date arrives. This is a further illustration of recovery according to the original tenor. The third defense is absence of completion and delivery under Section 15. Incomplete instrument not delivered. Where an incomplete instrument has not been delivered, it will not, if completed and negotiated without authority, be a valid contract in the hands of any holder as against any person whose signature was placed thereon before delivery. Absence of completion and delivery is a real defense because even if it is completed after delivery, it is not a valid contract in the hands of any holder, including a holder in due course. Therefore, even a holder in due course cannot collect on an instrument which is incomplete and undelivered. That's the reason why this is a real defense. The fourth defense is incapacity under Section 22. Effect of endorsement by infant or corporation. The endorsement or assignment of the instrument by a corporation or by an infant passes the property therein, notwithstanding that from want of capacity, the corporation or infant may incur no liability thereon. So actually, there are several forms of incapacity, and some of which are the following. Infancy or minority, lunacy or insanity, extreme intoxication, lack of corporate power, and husband and wife. An infant is a person under 18 years old. In our jurisdiction, it is held that an infant or insane or demented or one under extreme intoxication at the time of the execution of the instrument is not bound. Under the law, a husband and wife cannot make a valid contract with one another, and therefore neither of them can make a valid obligation from one to another on a negotiable instrument. A note by a husband to wife or wife to husband, therefore, is worthless even in the hands of a holder in due course. Similarly, an endorsement from one to the other will not be valid transfer and will create no obligation. Another kind of lack of capacity which also prevents an instrument from being genuine is where a corporation makes a note without authority. It may be that the corporation itself had no authority to make a note that is what is uh, called ultra-virus in legal phraseology. Or it may be that though the corporation had power to uh, make a note, the particular officer who attempted to bind the corporation did not have the power to do so. In either case, the corporation is not bound. There is an absolute defense, good even against a holder in due course, unless the corporation is precluded from setting up the defense by having induced a purchaser to believe that there was sufficient authority. Even if the corporation induced a purchaser to believe there was sufficient authority, it cannot exceed the limits imposed upon it by its charter. So the fifth defense is fraud. There are two types of fraud, the intrinsic and the extrinsic. And there are two types of intrinsic, that's what we have here. Two types of intrinsic, number one is fraud in the factum or fraud in esse contractus, which is a real defense. And the second type is fraud in the inducement, which is a personal defense. An example of fraud in the factum or fraud in ESC contractors is this. For example, if John tells his mother that he is taking a college course on handwriting analysis 
and for his homework, he needs her to read and sign a pretend deed. If mom signs the deed believing what he told her, and John tries to enforce the deed, mom can plead fraud in the factum. Fraud in the inducement is a personal defense. For example, if John tells his mother to sign a deed giving him her property, mom refuses at first, then John explains that the deed will be kept in a safe deposit box until she dies. If mom signs the deed because of this assurance from John, and John tries to enforce the deed prior to mom's death, mom can plead fraud in the inducement. So, dito sa fraud in the factum or fraud in esse contractus, hindi alam ni maker or ni drawer or ni acceptor na ang pinipirmahan niya ay negotiable instrument. Akala niya kung ano lang na dokumento pero hindi negotiable instrument. Napapirma siya, hindi niya alam na uh, negotiable instrument pala yon at siya ay may obligation dun sa instrument na yon. Yun ang real defense. Hindi niya alam na yung pinirmahan niya ay cheque or bill of exchange or promissory note. Dito sa fraud in the inducement, alam niya na yun ay promissory note, yun alam niya na yun ay cheque or bill of exchange, kaya lang may mga sinabi sa kanya na nakumbinsi siya na pumirma kahit na labag sa kalooban niya. Halimbawa, sabi nung nagpapapirma sa kanya, o sabi ng mother mo, pirmahan mo na daw yan, bilin ng mother mo na bago ka umalis, pirmahan mo yan. Pero hindi naman totoo. So, pinirmahan niya dahil uh, paniwala niya yun ang bilin ng nanay niya o ng magulang niya, pero hindi naman pala. So, alam niya negotiable instrument yun. Pero, na-induce lang siya dahil sa mga information na mali naman na sinabi sa kanya. So, itong fraud in the factum or fraud in the contractus, dahil hindi niya nga alam na negotiable instrument yun, ay real defense. Pero sa fraud in the inducement, alam niya na negotiable instrument, kaya lang may mga sinabi sa kanya di naman totoo na nakapag-induce uh, sa kanya para pirmahan. That is a personal defense. The sixth defense is duress. Duress is a defense similar to fraud. This was first confined to cases where a person was compelled to sign an instrument under imminent fear of bodily harm or imprisonment. But the defense has now been extended beyond that. There are many kinds of duress that do not threaten the person under duress himself with immediate harm. A husband threatens to shoot himself if the wife does not sign the instrument and brandishes a pistol so that his threat appears plausible and thereby induces the wife to sign the paper. She would have a personal defense against an obligation entered into in that way. So a threat to injure a child or to injure another person may have even more effect than a threat to injure the person himself whose signature is demanded. The test today is, was such pressure put upon the signer as to prevent him from being really a free agent in the matter? It is not jurist, however, to threaten to enforce one's legal rights unless an instrument is signed. For instance, a threat by a creditor to sue, or a threat to attach the debtor's property unless the debtor signed a note, would not be such duress as to create even a personal defense. Duress as against a party who is not a holder in due course, duress is a defense to an action on a negotiable instrument. The interesting case of Talmage versus Robinson exemplifies the radical change occurring over the years in the concept of jurist. Originally concerned with threats of bodily harm and criminal prosecution, jurist has expanded so as to include, in the Talmud's case, a threat of bringing disgrace upon the family by falsely accusing a recently deceased father of incest with one of his daughters. Another daughter signed the note to prevent the disgrace to the family. The seventh defense is lack of title. Lack of title in the holder of an order instrument is an absolute or real defense. Lack of title in the instrument payable to bearer does not prevent the holder from giving a good title, but lack of title in an instrument payable to order does. 
even though it be considered that the maker of a note or drawer of a check be liable, he has a right to pay the real owner of the instrument. If he should pay anyone who did not have title, the payment would not be a discharge of the instrument, and he would have to pay over again. Therefore, he has a defense against anybody who has no title. Consequently, a holder to recover on an other instrument must make out not only the defendant's liability on the instrument to someone, but also his own title to it. Another case of lack of title is where the holder of negotiable paper has become bankrupt. Under the law, all property which the bankrupt had at the time of his bankruptcy are vested in the trustee, including negotiable paper. Hence, one who innocently bought negotiable order paper from a bankrupt to whom it was payable after his bankruptcy would not be protected. The trustee in bankruptcy would have become the owner of it and the bankrupt himself would have no better right to it than if he held under a forged endorsement. If, however, the instrument was payable to Beren, under the general rule applicable to such paper, the bankrupt holder, though having no title himself, could transfer good title to a holder in due course. So, the next defense is illegality. Illegality may sometimes be an absolute defense, good against everybody, but it is most commonly used as a personal defense, good only against the original party to the illegality and those subsequent holders who are not holders in due course. Where there is a usury law, for example, usury is a personal defense. The sale of goods contrary to law, for example, illegal drugs, endangered animals, unlicensed firearms, etc., may give rise to a personal defense to a note given for the price. Instruments given as bribes to any person subject to a public or private duty to induce him to disregard that duty would be another illustration of illegality. Any transaction that involves a breach of fiduciary duty or official duty would be illegal and the negotiable instrument which form part of the transaction would be subject to a personal defense. The ninth defense is lack of consideration. Another personal defense is lack of consideration. If there is no consideration or value which the law requires for the obligation of any party to an instrument, he has a defense as against anybody but a holder in due course. The commonest kind of signature without consideration is that of an accommodation party. An accommodation party, therefore, even though the maker of the instrument cannot be sued by the holder, if the holder is the accommodated party. There is one peculiarity, however, about the defense of accommodation, which distinguishes it from all other personal defenses. An accommodation party has no defense merely because the holder took the instrument from the accommodated party with, with knowledge that it was given for accommodation. Generally, one who takes with the notice of a personal defense from one who was subject to that defense becomes himself subject to the defense in the same way as the man from whom he took it. One who takes from a fraudulent payee knowing of the fraud can no more collect than the fraudulent payee himself. But one who takes from an accommodated payee knowing of the accommodation can, if he gives value, collect from the accommodation maker. The reason for this distinction is plain. The accommodating party lend his signature for the very purpose of having it negotiated, and therefore it would be highly improper not to allow one who has relied on the signature to recover upon it, even though he knew perfectly well that it was for accommodation. In buying the instrument or lending money on it, he is doing exactly what the accommodating party expected him to do. The next defense is failure of consideration. A defense somewhat similar to lack of consideration and yet a different one is failure of consideration. This arises where an instrument is given for some prospective or promised return, which is not given. Suppose a note is given in return for a promise to deliver goods later. There is no lack of consideration, strictly speaking. For this note, because there was a promise to deliver the goods, 
and they promise is sufficient consideration for the note. But if the goods are not delivered when the time comes, there is failure of consideration. The thing expected was not given, the promise has not been kept. And thus, where there is failure of consideration, the person who was to give the consideration cannot recover because he has failed to give it. And any holder who took the note, knowing that the consideration had failed, will similarly be unable to recover. The next defense is discharge of instrument before maturity. Still another personal defense is discharge of an instrument before maturity in any way except by the cancellation of it. Cancellation of a negotiable instrument even before maturity is an absolute discharge of it. Any kind of discharge by payment, release, or accord and satisfaction is a good defense after maturity. Because after maturity, there can no longer be a holder in due course. Everyone who takes an instrument after maturity will take it subject to the defense of payment or release or accord and satisfaction. But payment or release or accord and satisfaction of a negotiable instrument before maturity is a personal defense. There may be a holder in due course after the payment or release and this holder in due course can sue again on the instrument and recover in spite of the fact that the maker has already paid once. The moral, of course, is plain. If an attempt is made to settle a negotiable instrument before it is due, it must be accompanied by a cancellation of the instrument, that is, some physical mutilation or destruction of the paper, sufficient to show that it is no longer a valid obligation. The last defense in our list is set off. Another personal defense may arise from a right of set off. Suppose the maker of a note has on another account a claim against the payee which the maker of the note could set off against the claim of the payee if the payee should sue on the note. Suppose the payee endorses the note. Can the maker use this right of set off against the endorsee who has purchased the note? Or must the maker pay the note in full to the holder, then try to collect his own claim from the original payee? It should depend on whether the endorsee was a holder in due course. If he is, he takes the instrument free of the right of set-off. If, however, he did not give value, or if he knew of the claim in set-off, or purchased the note after maturity, the maker of the note may assert his right of set-off against the endorsee. So we have discussed 13 defenses, some real, some personal, to obligations on negotiable instruments.